Hey, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours, where we answer your questions every day, seven days a week. Uh, so every every morning you can come in, we'll talk about it. We talk about a couple different things. So today is our usually our graphics day. We're going to be talking a little bit about the Apple Keynote, what was in it, but also what we saw, what we liked, what we didn't like about the production value. So, uh, so we're going to talk about that um, in the second hour. Uh, but Mondays are business. Uh, Tuesdays are graphics. Uh, Wednesdays are audio. Uh, Thursdays are video. And Friday is foundational. It's a lot of different things, uh, both uh, cloud, IT, uh, logistics, those types of things. Saturday, of course, uh, is Q&A and Sunday is introspection. So that's kind of how we break all of that out. Uh, you can ask those questions inside of Akana. Uh, you can ask the questions vote on the questions. Uh, if you don't know what that is, go to officehours.global slash join and you can join. You'll start getting emails and you'll see little buttons for it and then you can then you're in. Uh, if you don't want to do all of that, you can just go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global and you can ask your questions 24-7 and then we look at them. We had a ton of questions yesterday, so we brought a lot of them in. So the, a lot of the questions here this morning. And by the way, if you're watching right now, you should vote on questions because we got a lot of them. Um, so make sure to vote on those questions if you're inside of Makana. But if you're outside, of course, use askofficehours.global. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, Apple unveiled Apple Intelligence for iPhone, iPad, and Mac with generative writing tools across apps, image generation, app intents, and more. What was the most relevant for you across all these categories? And what sticks? I, I think that, I think you might have skipped. I don't have that question. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was you don't? That's where the you first thing that I'm question. seeing here. Um, Let's see. You on deck? You're, you're, yeah, we... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I think we. I have one from John Snyder from Reno, Nevada. Is the first I one there? I think all of us have that except for you. <laughs> Display. <laughs> so oh, that's weird. interesting. Uh, Wait yeah, a second. So, oh, there you go. And I got John Snyder up. Somehow things hadn't refreshed for me. My apologies. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that later. John Snyder, Reno, Nevada. Rorschach tests. Nearly all of Apple's AI announcement, except custom emojis, have been done in a very similar ways by other platforms. Is it mindless copying to catch up, or is AI or AI finally? done right good courtney well i think they should have served that announcement with a side of fries because it was a whole lot of ketchup um i think most of it you know apple that's apple's way you know they don't they're not normally first out of the gate with some new technology they wait for everybody else to come out and make their mistakes and then they try and improve on it um <clears throat> in this case i think they since they're depending upon open ai and made a deal with them i think their their own way of doing uh, ai maybe wasn't far enough along for them to announce anything yet so they did this deal so it is a bit of catch up and they're not really offering a lot of innovation there since it's they've outsourced it to uh, open ai for their for the ai portions you know they've they've done a few twists like you say with the ai emojis but uh, to try and make it their own uh, but they do give you access to chat gpt 4.0 hopefully without a, a subscription price. We don't know how fast that's going to be yet, but uh, so we'll see. Everything else was, you know, the the iOS, the camera apps is Google. Google's Photos been doing that for almost a year now. So, and offering that, they've opened that up to uh, the ability to, you know, move things around, remove things from the back of picture, background of pictures. Uh, that was originally only available for the Pixel phones, but now they've opened it up for all Android phones and Google um, you know, in, in uh, Google's photos. So I didn't see a whole lot new that was groundbreaking there. Go ahead, Nigel. So I probably couldn't agree or disagree more, I should say, with Courtney. I, I, I saw something entirely different. And what I, I would encourage everybody to do is, is don't zoom into the feature, zoom out a bit. Pull the camera back a bit. And this, to me, was the most important chart around AI. They said, when we do AI, it's going to be powerful, intuitive, integrated, personal, and private. And they were very deliberate with their AI here. And I would take these five things as whenever they do anything, you should ask, is it these five things? And if it isn't, don't do it. And they defined what those are. And I'd really encourage people to go back and watch that. Uh, some people heard me use the word manifesto. This is their manifesto. And to me, one of the biggest messages that came out of it yesterday was that AI is not about chat GPT. It's not about doing something fancy on your phone with your picture. It's about an approach to work. 
and an approach to work that is powerful, intuitive, is private, is secure. And if you think about it, most of the 45 minutes they spent on AI wasn't about ChatGPT. That was almost an add-on at the end of it. It was about how they're integrating into the experience. And I think we let the whiz-bang, bright, shiny objects of AI confuse us about really what this platform and what machine learning is going to do to the way we work. And I think what Apple did very well yesterday for a developer's forum and not a consumer uh, product announcement is step back a bit and show its developers how it's thinking about AI, what it's going to expect them to think about, and what they're doing to enable them. And so if I was a developer of an Apple program, I'd be very excited about some of what I saw yesterday. Good, Bill. So uh, I agree with particularly the piece about privacy at the end. Um, as part of the creator community, and I've been working in the creative arts for most of my life, one of the biggest anxieties I hear from everybody as AI rolls across us so quickly and, and with so many changes involved is what's going to happen to me and my intellectual property as I go forward. And by really leaning into the privacy and security aspects of this, I think a lot of creators are, are taking a small breath of, okay, if honestly everything I put up in this service can't suddenly be looked at by the large language models and surveyed for trends, and if my creative effort still has value in the marketplace because they're protecting me, that is a big deal for me. So I think they can make some inroads in telling creators working at their desktop, that if you stay in our ecosystem, you will have more protections, hopefully, theoretically, mm -hmm. than you will if you're just tossing your stuff into these big services and everybody's looking at it and whatever you do can become something everybody's doing in four hours. That Go scares ahead, a lot of creators. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I was going to say that the big thing about Apple's ecosystem is that there is a number of hardware elements tied into it. Um, it never ceases to amaze me when my Apple devices predict what I'm about to do. I periodically visit a family member, uh, only occasionally, maybe a couple times a month. But the other day, uh, Siri just figured it out. Like I turned on my car, I picked up my phone to enter in the address and it already knew where I was going to go just because of the time of the, I don't know why, because it wasn't in my calendar. Um, and that was integrated to my phone. It could be integrated to the watch. Um, they're integrating the, uh, AirPods more with being able to do gestures. I love that, that you can silently, uh, communicate with the AIs. And so that's where Apple, I feel like is going to be able to take AI further than anybody else. And that is to genuinely integrate it with us, with devices that we're wearing and carrying with us all the time. Yeah. The, the, um, yeah. you know, I think that, uh, we have to understand what Apple did because what, you know, and I think part of it is also understanding how Apple approaches things. Apple approaches things very much like what will 90% of the population want to do 90% of the time. And what they did here is that if you look at, if you look at the, you know, what they're, what they have is they have three layers of AI that that's going on. Um, and I think that that's important to think about. I had to think about it for a little while to really kind of have it break out. It's not just that they're doing all AI or chat GPT. They really have three layers. They have one, the first layer is what can I do on the device? So that is, that is the first part. And, the, and that will continue to grow as the device gets, gets faster. Um, the, you know, the, the 16 will be able to do more than the 15, the 17 will be able to do more. So they'll keep on doing more and more on the device. That's the most secure, most uh, responsive version of that. The next layer of that is that they're going to go into this private cloud that they're building. And that is got you know, external, this is still not chat GPT. This is the, the, the private cloud that is um, going to keep on getting bigger too. So these are two places they have an enormous amount of control over, <laughs> like, you know, so they can keep on growing these and building those models. And the thing that you, we, we should look at is that we saw the keynote, we'll talk about the keynote today. State of the union was really important. It got into all the geeky parts of how this works. This is no minor update for the way Apple's doing it. They, they really broke down for developers how they're doing the AI. And these are not trivial solutions that they're putting into both the, the phone and into the cloud. And then they have this linkage that kind of goes on the outside of it, which is, 
you know, this is the chat GPT, but it could be Gemini there. It's a linkage. You want to think of it that way. It's like, you can go out to that if you want to. Like, so, so the thing is, is that, and you don't have to cut and paste. So you don't have to open up chat GPT. All they're doing with chat GPT, they're not integrating chat GPT into the Apple ecosystem other than saying, if you want to use an external uh, solution beyond what we're solving, here is the, here is the, you, you, it's integrated into the app and it not only is integrated for Apple, it's integrated for all of their developers. So all of their, their developers can sit there and just go, well, this is just available now. So and that and can be used as an input, but this is, um, and if you look at what they're solving, what they're solving in the hardware and in the cloud is I'm, I will argue 90% what of what 90% of their average user using their their hardware is going to ask for 90% of 90% is the is what Apple's doing the other 10% is this other part but we have to understand that chat gpt and and gemini and all these other ones and to that apple they're all interchangeable they are not tightly integrated into apple solutions they're simply a link they've already said we'll probably support gemini they might support Claude, they might support lots of other things. They might support all of them um, at one time. Those are just, a, if you want to go out, it's, it's kind of like, do you want to go out to the web? You know, except that you don't have to go out and cut and paste and bring it back in. It'll just insert the things that you were already going out to. So I, I think that it's a, it's a pretty interesting solution to how Apple is approaching this problem. Um, and I, I don't think that it, you know, I think, I, I don't think that it's a, uh, it's not a catch up, it's a rethink. Of how this of how this uh, this process goes, and I think that it's going to be, uh, and I don't think that it's necessarily. I mean, there may be better solutions. It's not going to be as wide open. A lot of stuff that happens in the in the secure in the private cloud and in the phone are all going to look the same, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Apple users will have a, a lot of stuff that looks very similar to each other, but it'll also work most of the time. The hallucinations will probably be much lower. You know, things will look. If you want something to look like an emoji, that person's going to look like an emoji. You don't have to do figure out how to prompt something in Mid Journey to look like an um, emoji. It'll 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 come out that way, and so that's how they've trained it. And so, and again, we have to look at not what we want as creators or what we want as geeks, but what does the average user need? And I think Apple solved average user needs incredibly effectively. Um, you know, for that and said, oh, by the way, anything else that's happening over here, you get access to that too. You don't have to cut and paste it. And that's all, you're, all they're avoiding. All they're really giving you a chat GPT is not having to cut and paste, you know, it, from the chat GPT app that already exists. Uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Well, I, I'll disagree a bit. Uh, the problem is right now, we don't know because they haven't really released it yet. Uh, and when it does appear, apparently, it's only going to be available on the iPhone 15 Pro and the iPhone 15 Pro Max. That's two models of phones. So that's a fairly limited market, uh, unless everybody out there always upgrades every time there's a new new iPhone out there, and they always buy the most expensive one. I know a lot of you guys do, but, uh, you know, not the general public doesn't do. And there have been other, uh, you know, there's, there's other other things out there like Copilot that has been available for about a year that does a lot of these similar things. It supports local LLMs on your device using uh, NVIDIA's GPUs or NPUs in the latest uh, Lunar Lake uh, chipsets from Intel and and will uh, support it on all the new uh, uh, elite chips, ARM chips that are coming out uh, for the Surface Pro series. So, uh, yeah, we we have to kind I mean, of wait to see I mean, how, is, it, how it all, how that, it all. Other people do the same things is like most well, cars, cars, all cars. Well, are you can't say the they same. do it better because it hasn't come out yet. No, I'm not, I don't think they're saying they're doing it in an Apple way. I don't, I didn't say it was better or worse. I think well. it's a rethinking of it. It's, it's looking at their market and their users. Um, you know, Apple doesn't have to, Apple's not trying to uh, use this to take market. They just have to keep their, their users happy. They don't have to like try to compete with the Joneses of they're going to suddenly lose a lot of market share, or gain a lot of market share because Apple users aren't going anywhere for the most part. And so, the, and so, and Apple keeps on just all they have to do is, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those resources. They don't have to be in the front. They just have to be in the top five all the time. And, 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 they, and, then they, and they can, they'll, they'll just keep growing, you know, like, you know, like they're not, you know, so the thing is, is because all the other integration that they have is, it, it gives them an advantage, you know? Um, 
So the uh, advantage uh, if you own the latest hardware. That's the problem here. Well, Apple never looks back. Like you know, that's right. that's a pretty common <laughs> thing for Apple. Uh, they, they they they'll they'll sell yeah. a lot of phones in September. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So for me, uh, you're talking about that made perfect sense, and it, it the thing I find interesting is you'll get a little warning from what uh, they said in the keynote. When you leave that outer ring and go out into the wider web, it will let you know it's, that you it's not are so much leaving. a warning. It'll just say, "Do you want to do this? Like, do you, you want to do this?" You, you, they give you the you every option single time to opt out of leaving right. that, which will remind you constantly of something that I think it's it's been one of my problems with the web for particularly kids and things like that is you never really know where you are. You're you're just looking up things and you don't know whether it's a secure site or an insecure site, whether it's run by a responsible organization or by a bunch of yahoos. You just never have any idea when you're cruising the web. At least now there's an opt-in. It's not forced on you, but an opt-in little fence that says, be aware of where you are when you're doing this. And I think that is, and I'd like to see more of that on the web. Opt-in, not preclude, but let me know where I am and how well, and, safe or unsafe it is for what I want to do. Yeah, and, and for the most part, it just, and it also just allows you to very seamlessly integrate all these solutions into not only Apple apps, but any developer that's developing on the on the platform. So they're going to be able, you know, these are going to be APIs. These are going to be libraries that can be that 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 developers can use to simply just add those things to it. They don't have to. They don't have to. Um, that's a huge. I mean, that's what I think. That's why, of course, they're talking about it at WWDC, is that developers now will be able to input all these things without having to do the work. You know, if you look at like a lot of the AR tools, the the photogrammetry tools or LIDAR tools, they're all using the same libraries that Apple did a lot of work on that they don't have to. They're simply putting in a, their own take on it, their own workflow, their own interface, so on and so forth. And, and the reality is, is I think that, you know, what most people miss is that most of success is really about the interface. It's not about the substance. <laughs> like people, you know, like we talk about that a lot. It's like, and so people think that, well, the substance is all the same. It doesn't, I mean, you know, all cars have four wheels or most cars have four wheels. Um, they, most cars are very similar to each other. It's fit and finish features interface that, that is why people buy one car or another. Um, next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas is up next. Is Apple Intelligence able to outsource compute to Apple servers with cryptographic guarantees of privacy, prompt injection risks, and more? And he's got a link there to a PC Mag article. Good, Nigel. I think Alex just did a really good description of the three layers uh, of security. And I think the implication is that's exactly what's going to happen. And again, I'd remind everybody we're in day one uh, product wise view. What is a very long journey? I suspect within three years, a majority of Apple users will be on a device that can use all of this. And when you zoom out, that's what you see. I think the other thing strategically Apple did is, and maybe it fits with their platform, is they move the battle onto turf they can win, which some people view as an integrated platform, some people view as a closed garden. You know, six of one, half dozen of the other. Well, and that's why very few. I mean, Chris Christie said, "Well, I used to use a Mac, a Mac and I don't Apple, and I don't use them anymore." And that's that. But but Chris is one of the very few. If you look statistically, <laughs> the movement is very small uh, away from that. And that and part of that is a deep, that deep integration between the hardware, the software, the cloud so services. It's really hard to you know um, pry people out of that system. You know, and um, once they're in and they get comfortable with it, and everything just kind of works and. They don't have to deal with a lot of the linkages. I know I have a friend who just went from a Mac to a PC and I'm going back. <laughs> like, like they were just like, this is too much. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, uh, so I, um, I think that this is, they don't, again, they're building their version of this. It is not better or worse than others. It's just different, it's, it, but it's very Apple-y. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Well, we don't know how different it's going to be since they're using a lot of the chat GPT. They're not, though. I think, I think you keep on making that mistake. They're not using it. Chat GPT is well, an open outer AI, edge. Open AI. Yeah, but, but they're not using all those, those the core pieces of what you'll use 90% of the time on an Apple device. 90% I'm of not your talking about the local, local. Elements. Yeah, but I'm the local talking about and the, the private cloud is 90% of what an Apple user will the use. the internet. But it's 10% of what you'll use the AI for. Like the 90% oh, of the AI, 90% of an average user is going to be using what's on the phone and what's in the private cloud. And they have access to these outer things. But the idea that, that ChatGPT is deeply integrated into what Apple's doing is a complete 
it, that it's completely wrong. <laughs> like, like it's just wrong. Well, like it depends it's not, on what you're doing. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feature that you can say, Hey, I want to, it's like when Siri says, you can, would you like me to search the web? Chat GPT will say, Hey, would you like to go out and I mean, Apple will say, would you like to go out to chat GPT? Cause we don't, these are other options other than all the other things that we're doing. And it leaves Apple in a place to continue. It allows their users to, de- to grab things from chat GPT or Gemini or other things when they want to, but it also puts Apple in the middle where they can keep on adding all the features that they want. So they're going to keep on backfilling all of these features into the system um, as they keep on training the, the AI. So the thing is, is that it's not that, it, but it, it gives you the flexibility of going out. But 90% of what, if you look at what they actually, the kind of things that they do in the private cloud and the kind of things they do on the device, that's what the app, not us, the average user will use 90% of the time. You know, like, well, and, it's, and so, the, and this is like this little, but I think that's a huge mistake that the press is making of this whole, like, ChatGPT is, Apple just gave it over to ChatGPT. Apple gave this outer little edge to ChatGPT to, to, to provide some flexibility for their users. But most of the, the, most of the heavy lifting is all being done by Apple with their own AI. You know, well, like, and if you, and again, you have to look at the state of the union. The, 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 the keynote is not the same. The, the state of the union outlines what Apple's doing in detail. Right. The, um, however, I think uh, a lot of what people are doing is creating images. They're, you know, cleaning up photos. They're doing image recognition and, and they're inquiring, you know, uh, trying to get, gather information. If you don't want to gather information just from within your phone or from an LLM that will fit in your phone, uh, it's going to have to go out to the internet. So I think I disagree. I think uh, Alex and I differ on what, a phone is you what most people are going to be using it for but uh and, and i think uh there's a very it's tough for anyone to prevent against uh um you know prompt injection attacks or jailbreaking uh yeah. as everyone has found out the um uh you know you can do it by putting up guardrails and guardrails in, involve a lot of filtration and that takes up a lot of memory to to filter the stuff before it, it's handed over to the net, uh, neural net I, but um, I think, uh, uh, you know, I just don't, don't we, I, I, we don't know yet. I think, I think we have to work. When we say what will most people, how will most people use AI? Most people are not using AI. Like, I think that we, we live in this world where we think everybody's using AI because we all use it. The vast majority of people that you talk to are not using ChatGPT. They are not using AI. They are not using any of this, these tools that most, most are not <laughs> like, you know, and then, and the, you know, the, the geeky ones and the ones that are reading all this stuff are, are reading it, but it's, but it's not, it's definitely not over 50% um, of the users out there are using it. So what Apple is going to be doing is providing a whole bunch of services that are super seamless, that are super easy to use that people weren't using before. Like the, this will be their, the, most of the Apple services will be their introduction to AI because they weren't using it before. Yeah, go ahead, Nigel. I think if you use a Discord server, you're not a regular user. I mean, the 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 jump to get into Discord to use, uh, I know oh, yeah, you're... that's not the only interface anymore, but to use those sorts of features like Mid Journey is very high. And and I think when I, I look at what I do and my wife does on her machine, um, I I think she wants this level of integration you're talking about. And by the way, if you don't, I'm running the beta on my phone. ChatGPT works great. Yeah. And... I use it all the time as well. Next question. Next question comes to us from Matthew LeCount in Oakland. Is this part of the Blackmagic design relationship Apple hinted about in the keynote? Go ahead, go ahead Nick. Uh, yes, it, yes, it is. Uh, Blackmagic actually just posted a uh, official press announcement for themselves on their website uh, less than half an hour ago. And so I don't know if uh, I... Hopefully that someone here is able to share that out. I don't have screen sharing right now. Uh, but that camera is specifically intended to be uh, part of an end-to-end production tool set uh, between Apple and Blackmagic. So uh, the press release says that both the software for you know resolve as well as the camera itself will be available later this year but they're announcing it right now um i have to say the size of those lenses look fantastic uh, a lot of um 180 degree lenses are, are are really small you know like uh maybe double the size of a gopro lens this this looks like it could be good 
four times the size of that. And so we're gathering quite a lot more light. Um, also, the resolution of this is phenomenal. Um, so we're getting a, uh, you know, more than, I think it's more than UHD per eye. Oh, yeah. It's, it's 8160 by 7200 per eye. Per eye. Yeah. So per we're getting, the, is that 8K per eye? It's um, 12K per eye. 12 12 no, 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 it's it's 8K. I. It's yeah, I'm it's, thinking 8K. It's 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 the uh, it's the H. It's the horizontal. It, there's resolution. two of the 12K sensors from Blackmagic. One in each eye. It's shooting 90 th 90 frames per second, and it's got 16 mm -hmm. stops of dynamic range. Yeah, and honestly, as someone who was, I, I've you know really been interested in immersive video capture um, for quite a long time. One of my great frustrations in the uh, previous iteration of this is that there was a collection of startup camera companies, organizations. I mean, Nokia had a really nice immersive camera, which would have been great for 180, by the way, but you know, it got uh, repurposed for 360. Um, but it was just so heavy and expensive and specialized. And you, there, there was almost no software that could actually edit that video effectively. You were going, you know, transitioning that into Nuke and things like that, um, which is great for shot by shot visual effects for a feature film, but not what you want to use to edit video that you want to, uh, you know, move through a pipeline quickly. So the idea that a company with Blackmagic's track record with its uh, Ursa platform and its chips for uh, capturing the images is uh, tied in with DaVinci Resolve into Apple's intended ecosystem is is phenomenal. So that I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I probably won't be able to afford the camera, but um, there are a lot of other ways to shoot immersive and then and still get the advantage of being able to end it, all of that in Resolve. So this is this is really nice. Good, Bill. Yeah, this is the the early things. I'm trying to read as much as possible just to try to figure it out. And and you know the camera isn't built yet. They gave it what three and a half seconds and one picture on there, and everybody in the video community went, "What the heck is that? That doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before." It's got a really interesting dual lens front end on it, and so. Uh, News Shooter and some of the other people, that's the article that uh, was just mentioned, uh, did a little bit of a breakdown. There's a couple of websites who have gotten an early look, and they've done a little bit of this. It's going to be a, a different kind of experience, and they're talking about Blackmagic being kind of out of the gate here first with not only the ability to shoot something that is at the higher end reg uh, above the Canon camera that they announced at the same time, which is a smaller kind of pocket form factor. This looks more like a production camera. Uh, it shoots into Blackmagic RAW, which means that it is a compressed format, but Blackmagic RAW has been, uh, there's a good workflow for it behind the scenes. So a lot of people who are going to be interested in a much higher resolution uh immersive workflow it seems like it'll be the leader out of the gate for that we'll see what happens afterwards yeah there, there's a there is a uh, of course there's the the canon R, uh, r5c which is the the one that's out there right now but it doesn't have the same frame rate the 90 90 frames a second is much closer to the frame rate required for the apple vision pro uh we a lot of us wished it was 120 i'm sure of course that would take more processing power but 120 is a better it's a better format because it goes over the 95 frame 95 96 frames that we feel it really takes you to another level of how how something experiences. So I feel we a lot of us feel like the ninety frames is a little short um, that Apple is and a lot of other folks have landed on. Um, also, one twenty is evenly divisible by sixty, thirty, and twenty four, which means that we can you know rebuild those frames if we want to to go back to those things. Uh, one thing that I'm I don't as I look at it clear, more clearly, I don't think it's going to happen. But a lot of us would love to have a rectilinear set of lenses as well so that we could do stereo 16 by 9 not just immersive uh, 180 but it really looks like this camera is going to be uh, you know some of us have looked at it and thought well maybe they can take the front off and put another front on that would let you put other lenses on um, but not sure if that's going to be possible or not the other concern that i have looking at it and i'm just it'll be interesting to see is whether we'll have it, it does look like it could but i'll um Convergence is a big deal. It it is, uh, you know, so the con a lot of the cameras out there, the Canon camera and a lot of other cameras, do not do convergence uh, in the lens. They they do it in software later, and I don't think that that's as good a solution. 
Um, I think that there is a real power to having, I've done a lot of work with and without convergence. And I think that convergence is much harder to manage, but it produces a better result from a stereo perspective. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so it'll, it'll be really interesting. I mean, I'm, they're definitely very excited to play with it. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. So the other thing that I, I just noticed, by the way, is that this camera has four 10G Ethernet ports on it. And I remember back when the new latest iteration of the Mac Pro came out about just how much bandwidth its motherboard had and the various uh, ports on it had. And so this looks like an out-of-the-box camera that could potentially stream yeah. live immersive video if it's passing through a Mac Pro. You'd hope that they'd build it so that it would do live. You know, and, and, you know, black magic moving away from the, uh, uh, moving away from baseband, um, into a 2110 or some version of 2110 would lead us to believe that this one theoretically could do that. Um, so, and Apple and, you know, their compressed format and so on and so forth that lets it go out, theoretically they could deliver the full 8K per eye, uh, at 90 frames a second through that IP connection. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what's possible, you know, with this camera, but it does look, it looks pretty exciting. Uh, it's the, there's the picture of the beast. If somebody wants to yeah, switch the, to it. Yeah. We've looked at it a couple of times in the thing. So, but, oh. but the, um, uh, I think that it's going to be, uh, this is the first production camera that we've seen like true production camera coming out that isn't some kind of, uh, in this current version, you know, Panasonic had one in the past and other people have had them, but this is the first one that we've seen that is truly a production camera um, that is uh, in this version and and that could give us a lot of these tools and that hasn't been an art project. Most of us build other ones and they're all kind of art projects in my opinion. Um, so. And Alex, I was also uh, thinking about the convergence that you had mentioned and mechanical convergence is critical when you're using a standard style cine lens, right? So 35 millimeter, 80 millimeter, 200 millimeter. But if you're shooting onto an 8K wide chip with a 180 degree lens, uh, you, your interocular is fixed. I'm looking at some images of the underlying chassis and it does look like the lensing is fixed. Mm -hmm. However, if you're just taking a crop out of those 180 degree lenses anyway, mm -hmm. you can adjust your interocular uh, convergence just by choosing a different crop across that lens. It could so, be, I, I, I will, I'll argue that it's slightly different. It, it is pro it's probably from a logistical perspective, it's easier to just make them parallel. But from the test that we've done, I'll argue that it's not quite the same, you know, and that that little difference you can feel when you see the two, the two, the two different ones, when you see converge, uh, me mechanical convergence versus uh, uh, digital convergence, it's different, like it feels different, and it feels much more like you're there. And, and I think that that's the it's just how it feels. But again, I, I think that the logistics of that are very difficult. Um, next question. Robert Linkrum in Belmont Shores, California is up next. From CNET, Adobe defends changes in its terms of service amid Gen AI explosion. It could still cause issues for creative creators, even as Adobe says it won't scan every file. And that's from a 10th June 24 dissect. And he says, yep. please discuss. Now go ahead, Nick. Um, I, I, this is one of those, it feels like a very unforced error. Like someone was looking around at Adobe, he's like, should we tell them? Do we want to tell them? Do you, do you think we should tell them? Like, yeah, we should tell them. Well, somebody should tell them. Like, the, the changes to the, um, the terms of service happened quite a long time ago. And I, I feel like anyone who uses social media is aware that, okay, I'm posting into this content system that is going to use that to direct ads to me. I'm the product because I'm using this for free. Now we're paying for licenses for Creative Cloud. Um, but I, I think that had Adobe gotten ahead of this and made their announcements before releasing Firefly and having people really using it and, and made it clear, this is something you can opt into or not opt into. Because I think there's a lot of people who are using the AI features now that will appreciate how the ability to adjust based on content that's being adjusted by users will improve the system. You know, I mean, right now, you, if you generate 
dog images, for example, you might get more than four legs. And so when you clean that up yourself, having the AI improve because it's picking up that you've been cleaning that up is going to make that kind of production work more seamless. Um, but absolutely, there's a huge segment of users and artists that work under NDAs that are very particular about their art, that the work that they're doing is, is the effort that they're putting in. And the last thing that you want is for that to become trivialized by it being turned into a generative button. So I think that, you know, had Adobe made this announcement before rolling it out and made it very public at the beginning, probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But the reality is that people really didn't notice that this was happening and didn't think about it until Adobe got around to like, oh, by the way, we're doing this. And um, and now that the people are realizing it, they're like, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to have to use something else now. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, lawyers tend to to write stuff in a uh, <clears throat> a general way and always like to uh, uh, make things vague because then they have the ability to, you know, guide them whichever way is best suits them in the future. You see those end user license agreements out there that say, you know, by uh, using our service, you grant us the right to use your, any material you upload to our site uh, on, on any, in any country, on any planet in the universe. And it's actually written that way. <laughs> uh, although we only know of one planet in the universe that would be able to use it right now. But uh, they they make them generally broad. And I think a lot of people reacted to this. And and in, in order to, uh, uh, it doesn't grant the rights. And they went in and clarified the, the, the language, I think, in the end user agreement as, as a result of the reaction to make it clear that in order to actually use, you know, be make the service useful, the A service useful, you've got to be able to, uh, upload your picture in it, into it to have it analyzed, et cetera. It's got to have access to your your work in order to work on it. So, um, you know, I think they they there was a, the knee jerk reaction was a little bit overreaction to the broad language that was in there, and they had to go in and clarify it a little bit. I think uh, uh, OpenAI, and if you're using if you're doing proprietary stuff, if you're designing proprietary designs that are top secret. Uh, for the government or for Apple or for any any manufacturer that wants to, to maintain a level of secrecy, you would probably be prohibited from using any type of, type of AI tools to begin with, uh, because the chance of a leak, you'd be be working in a sandboxed area. So probably wouldn't even allow access to, to these tools. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, I, I think that I mean, Adobe has to pay a lot of attention to this because there's a lot of creators out there and the creators are very sensitive. I mean, the reality is, is that content without context is going to become worthless in the next five years. So content itself, just sitting on its own by itself is not going to be worth anything. You know, like we're going to be able to produce anything we want it to look like, everything else. Contextually, inside of a story, inside of a team, inside of all those things, it still has a lot of value. And, and how you, and, and so the thing is, is that, you know, the creation of that um, and people being interested in that has value. But I think people hanging on to this idea that they're gonna produce an image that's gonna be worth a lot of money, is, you know, it's probably not gonna happen. You know, and so, and so I think we have to be realists about where we're, where we're at. And I think people who get caught up in this, it's fine, but it's like 95 or 99% of Adobe users. I think Adobe's gonna deal with this little, little firestorm that goes over they're obviously they might make, tweak things a little bit but no one's going anywhere what else are the, you know like what else do they have i mean you know like like i use i use uh, a lot of the other tools that that you would use instead of photoshop but fundamentally with it is the ai generator inside of photoshop that i use every single day and it's why i can't give up photoshop is the ability to extend images and so on and so forth and you know what i don't care I don't care if it looks at what I'm doing. I'm extending a poster frame to a 16 by nine to put up on a screen. Like I don't, like it doesn't matter to me and it doesn't matter to 99% of the people who use Photoshop that are simply just adjusting things, moving things, moving things around, putting those things together. And I know that the creative industries are really worried about this, but but the the reality is, is that the content by itself, content by itself outside of the context of the story, the delivery platform, the person who made it, all of that stuff is is not going to be worth anything, you know. And so, um, and so you you have to look at how do you build your network, how do you build your following, how do you become part of that team. Those things all have value and will continue to have value for quite some time. Um, but but by itself, no, probably not. So that I think I think that people that get wound up by it are looking at the wrong thing. 
Uh, next question. I forgot that I was host. Paul Wallace. See, now I can't, I can't remember who, whether I'm host or not. <laughs> I had that anyway, yeah, yeah, over and over. I said my piece, and then I was like waiting for Bill to join, and nothing happened. All right, so yeah. <laughs> Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, up next. Apple unveiled Apple Intelligence for iPhone, iPad, and Mac with generative writing tools across apps, image generation, app intents, and more. What was the most relevant to you across all these categories, and what sticks? Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, as I was watching the keynote, the first thing I, I thought to myself was, boy, that's kind of a ballsy kind of a thing to try to rebrand AI from artificial intelligence to Apple intelligence. But I can see the the goal here to differentiate their take on AI from the generic one that has gone everywhere, because now it is pretty generic. I mean, it's like Kleenex for tissues. Everybody used the term for a while when the marketing was big. And now people who try to do that better, say puffs or something with lotion in the tissue, have to spend a lot of marketing money to say that we are different than the standard thing. I think Apple's getting ahead of that and trying to say we are different than the standard thing. We have different criteria for what we're going to do. And Alex articulated some of that with all the on-chip stuff and inside the ecosystem stuff. And we think that there's value in that. and We should let you know about it. So it's a bold move, I think. I go, Nigel. So every week I, I write a Substack. And uh, here's what I do is I get my Word document up. I start writing. I jump into ChatGPT for ideas and for thoughts. I cut and paste that back in again. Grammarly uh, make sure my grammar and spelling is good. Uh, I use Midjourney for the graphic. I finish the thing. I send it back to ChatGPT to proofread it. And then I go to ChatGPT and say, please give me a headline. If I could do all of that within pages or Word, this would be a much simpler ex thing to do. It's not that hard. I mean, for me, it's not hard to jump, cut and cross between other apps. But I think for less technically sophisticated people, being able to do all of that within a single platform will drive incredible advantage. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting to me is uh, the calculator, the hand written calculator app. And yeah. what was interesting to me is in terms of the, you know, Apple intelligence and, and what it's doing there is it's interpreting what you're writing and interpreting not only what you're writing and what it means, but what you will want to do next. So the idea that you could uh, generate like a, a roller control to adjust an angle. You've written a, a number, 45, with a little degree symbol next to it. And then you can generate a, a knob to then roll that number. Um, it, it's fine for a calculator. And that in and of itself might only be specifically useful to math teachers or something like a math tutor. But in my mind, I want that kind of functionality for something that understands production technology. Uh, one of the assignments I give my students in the virtual production class is they need to draw out on their own an entire technical di diagram of the studio, all of the, the 1G network connections, the 10G network connections, all the SDI routing, all of the time code and genlock signals, and what system is on you know, the render boxes on the high-speed network connected to the, uh, the high-speed file server, and all of that. Um, and, and it's like a one-week assignment for the students, and, and they roll their eyes. If an AI could just like, I could just sketch like, okay, I need, here's my camera and I want SDI from here to here, or I just picked this color as the SDI color. And it's able to diagram out what I want set up for a, a one-time live event stage setup. And it comes out as something that the technical crew can look at at a glance and, okay, I know exactly what cables I need to run. I know what signals need to be set up. Um, that type of interpreted, uh, input is going to be really, really useful. <laughs> yeah. And I, again, I, I just will reiterate that this is what Apple's doing is introducing many, many people to AI seamlessly in a way that they don't really think about it at all. I mean, they're just going to be part of all these apps and all the apps that are that they're buying and everything else is not going to be it's basically it also is commoditizing ai to in a lot of ways for apple users at least so you're not going to be able to stand out very well of well, i created ai because apple's going to have a bunch of stuff that every developer is going to have ai in, in, incorporated into their app and they're not going to have to uh they're not going to have to come up with it <laughs> they're not going to have to buy it from gpt to do many many uh, buy it from open ai to do many of these things um and so i think that's going to be a really interesting uh 
you know, puzzle for that process. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was just going to point out to Nigel that that uh, AI and Microsoft Word and and has been available, you know, for several months now for, with Copilot for Microsoft 365. It is a subscription for the professional version. It, it adds AI to the Copilot AI, which is based on OpenAI, of course, uh, to all the uh, Office tools, uh, PowerPoint, uh, you know, Word, Outlook. Et cetera, et cetera. So it is available now and has been for a while, uh, but it is a subscription and Apple may be offering it for free. It's free on the Apple one. Yeah, go ahead, um, uh, Nigel. It's always going to end up as a battle between ecosystems. You're going to pick your ecosystem and live with it. For those who live in the Apple ecosystem, Word works great on the Mac, by the way. And, and so yeah, if they yeah, could do that's everything why I pointed in out, Word, it is cross platform, I think, you know. It is. Yeah, yeah, you can totally use it in there. It's just that there's a lot of uh, Apple users that don't have uh, Office. <laughs> the only Apple users that have Office are people at co- that work at companies that force them to. Um, pretty much you talk to anybody, any Apple user that isn't at an Office that forces them to use Office 360, they don't have it. They have pages and they have numbers because it's all free, you know, and it looks nicer. <laughs> like, you know, so, so, and so, uh, so most, uh, most, there, I don't know very many Apple users that are using it unless it's forced on them by their company. Um, so that's, so again, it's a whole bunch of new people that, that are, aren't, aren't using Apple doesn't, again, Apple doesn't have to be the front horse. It just has to be in the front five. Um, and, and the ecosystem and the people that are using it are, are going to be comfortable with that process. Um, next, uh, next question. Eric Hertz in Hartford, Connecticut. Apple mentioned a Vimeo app designed for Vision Pro. What is unique about this app? Uh, go ahead, Nick. Okay. So I have no inside information about this app, but speculatively, uh, there'd be a few things that I would expect in such a dedicated app. One is it might be drawing from a different set of servers than the rank and file servers that are used for the uh, standard 2D playback. Uh, So it could be servers and um, internet connectivity that is going to support the higher resolution and it's going to be tailored to the uh, fact that you're going to be getting more pixels uh, in any given moment because you're getting that stereoscopic. However, on the flip side, another thing that this app I would expect would have is a uh, some way of bidirectionally sharing foveation information. So they mentioned this in the uh, keynote the other day. Um, now, foveation is the idea that our eyes really only see sharply in the direction they're looking in directly. So our peripheral vision is is pretty low resolution. And so foveation is a rendering approach that focuses the high resolution rendering effort on the area that the eyes are looking at. So we're, we've got eye tracking in the Vision Pro. And so the Vision Pro knows what part of the left and the right screen each of those eyes are looking at. And it If it can pass that information and predictively understand where people are looking at most of the time. So if I have a piece of content and it's been played a million times, I could, in theory, collect the data as to what parts of the frame do people look at the most and make sure that those parts of the frame are the ones that have the highest fidelity resolution uh, in the stream. And so these are things that, that I would think would be integrated into a you know, dedicated Vision Pro immersive video streaming app. Go ahead, Bill. So I use Vimeo a ton. In fact, it's the content distribution network that most of my work gets tossed into because my clients all want to take that and do something with the content. Most of the advertisers want to download it, and we have private mailboxes for each of them so that they can get access to it. But the other thing it's really good for, if you're going to be embedding videos in websites and things like that, you need those embed links. Vimeo is really good at generating and uh, creating those such that if you want to embed video work from the content distribution network, which is Vimeo, into web pages, it's super simple. You just capture the 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 link and give it to your webmaster and that person then puts that on the web page and everything works seamlessly plus it's really nice if i change a video if we have a price update or something like that for a, a regular retail one it just immediately gets sent up to the cdn and that reflects on the web pages immediately so it's an integrated way to distribute video content um, as to the vision pro particularly i've been recently asked to do quite a few vertical video things for 
particular web page kind of uses. And it was interesting. The first time I uploaded one to my Vimeo account, it looked like it was pillar box. So there was two big black bars on the outside because Vimeo is still thinking it's a 16 by 9. But when my clients downloaded it, what came down was the 9 by 16 version to them. So I think they have some work to do when they get this vision content coming in in terms of the interface inside of Vimeo to make it something that makes sense for the users of immersive content. And I think they're working on that. And that's, I think, part of the announcement is we have this new pipeline and we're going to rebuild things so that it works for that. Next question. Ian Alford in London says, can Alex walk us through his Mimo setup that he used for the second year experience? It turned out really well. Did Alex really build the Mimo layout shortly before the show? <laughs> wow. I did. I did. <laughs> I, I, did I did. I Well, so, so it, it, it is, uh, you know, we, we tested a bunch of different ways of doing it on Sunday. So on Sunday, we spent about three hours and Andy jumped in and a lot of us kind of worked on ideas about how we're going to do it. And what we ended up with, and this had to do with the process, I was taking all the individual feeds and out of Zoom ISO and putting them into uh, into Mimo, and the my processor uh, load got really high, ninety six percent. And so I, I thought that might not be appropriate to do a show that probably is going to be seen by a lot of concurrence. So um, so I so we we backed into uh, using, um, and we had already planned to use tiles for the gallery, but we really leaned on it. So really, most of what you saw, almost the complete show that you saw there, was using Zoom tiles. That whole layout, the background, even the background. So that background, I loaded the background into Zoom tiles. I, I, it's hard for me to bring up and show to you because it needs to be in something to be, make sense. But, um, but it was all done in Zoom tiles and it was delivered. The opening frame and, and the audio was managed inside of Mimo. So let me show you how, what, what this looked like because here, here was the, what we were trying to solve. So number one is I wanted something dynamic that I could change the number of people really quickly without, without having to build something new. And Zoom tiles solved that really, really well. Number two is that I wanted to be able to play listen and watch the keynote inside of the gallery with the other panelists, but I didn't want that to go to the show. So as a pure second, this has been us evolving this over the last couple of years. We have this problem where the all the panelists are looking at their own version of the feed and they're all in different places in time. And so it was really important for us to have uh, us all see it at the same time. So what we did to make that actually work is um, if you look at this here, this is, so we had the, we had Apple's uh, keynote coming in over YouTube and that went into, we brought that into Zoom and, and screen shared it into Zoom, into the Zoom cloud here. So that was the, um, so that's how we delivered it to it. And then we also had our uh, remote participants. It was, I told, it says uh, me plus, uh, well, there was, yeah, seven that just came in over into Zoom here. Then I joined as Tiles, and I also joined as Zoom ISO. So the interesting thing is I turned off the audio and video for Zoom ISO so that all it was there to do was grab the audio. That's all I used it for is to grab the audio there. I actually joined as Zoom Tiles into Zoom. So I, we had the uh, seven other participants going into Zoom. We had a screen share of the Apple going into Zoom. So we all saw that here. Um, what Tiles did is then... Tiles grabbed it and I we generated what you saw. I mean, that's pretty much what you saw. The whole show was just tiles. Um, and then and then what we did is we uh, delivered the audio um, here. We had some we had some issues with uh, loopback for for whatever reason, but black hole audio worked fine. So we used black hole audio to deliver um, to Mimo. Now, what we used only a little bit, and one of the reasons we needed, of course, we were going past what tiles could do was that we needed that opening slate for the show. We also needed a, a, an active speaker. So instead of grabbing, we just, that one one studio doing, trying to do all of this, the tiles, Zoom ISO, screen sharing, everything else was too much. Um, so what we did is we just sent the active speaker to Mimo. So it would just be whoever was talking, I could cut to if, if I wanted to. It turned out the way our discussion worked, it didn't make as much sense to do that. But we had it there and we did use it a couple of times. So, um, but then otherwise we grabbed onto the screen. Mimo has this great tool, which just says, I see all these windows. It wasn't a raw screen capture. It's like, I see these windows, what do you want to grab? And so I grabbed it and I got this full screen of, of this that went in. So we had individual ISOs of audio, just in case we would have to control those coming in from black hole into Mimo. And then we had the Zoom, and this is all sitting on a Mac Studio Max. Uh, oh, the only thing that was outside of that, by the way, uh, was this Zoom here with YouTube came in from another Mac Mini. 
So I had a Mac Mini here um, that did that. And the reason I did that was because I, uh, uh, it was just too much processing power to, to do it again. And I already had two Zooms running on one, on one Mac Studio along with Mimo Live. Um, so, so that, and then Mimo then compressed that and put it on to YouTube. So that's, so it started at YouTube and ended at YouTube. Um, but, but the, um, but the, all of the stuff in between. So that's, that's how this was, uh, uh, that's how it worked. And I thought that, um, I was pretty happy with it. I mean, I think that it, I think that the panelists obviously did a great job. And one of the things that makes, I, I was talking to someone about it yesterday. One of the things that makes these shows so much fun to work on and so easy to do is the incredible work that the panelists do to look good. <laughs> so, so we have all these, like, like I could have done that. I could have done that, that, that whole mix and it would have been like, oh, it's kind of cool. You know, it's okay. If everyone was on there, like their bad webcam and their internal mic and everything else, part of what makes this golden is really uh, that, that the panelists do such a great job at looking good and sounding good and having great things to say. And I'm just wrapping it, around, wrapping a little bit of graphics around it. But but I think the pipeline was, um, it, it again, it was a little bit of a process to figure out what was going to make the most sense for this. But it turned out turned out pretty good. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. The Ursa Cine Immersive looks like an impressive camera. Could you build an immersive streaming workflow with current technology, or would certain parts of the pipeline need to catch up? And then there's a note here. I bet you'd need a constellation and deck link for 8K. Go ahead, Nick. So the answer is yes and no. Um, I'm sure, you know, with the Vision Pro and what Blackmagic is doing, partnering with them is certainly going to be better than what is standard available today. Um, and part, some of that is going to be, you know, the resolution that's in the Vision Pro, the foveation. Uh, certainly Blackmagic is well-versed in uh, metadata capture along with their video. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the metadata carries through from the camera at capture all the way through to Vision Pro on delivery as it goes through DaVinci Resolve edits. And so there's going to be a lot of optimizations that are possible in that workflow that simply don't exist right now uh, for, for folks just doing this on their own. But, you know, the rudimentary components of the technology certain exi certainly exist. I mean, there's lots of ways of shooting stereoscopic 180 degree video, and there's uh, off-the-shelf cameras that do it that you can order from B&H and, and get them and, uh, and start shooting and recording. Uh, quite a bit of the standard video editing software can edit stereo. Uh, so, you know, whether it's Final Cut or Resolve or, you know, anything else, um, they should be able to edit that video. Um, streaming, you know, I, there are proprietary solutions for doing that. There are uh, like uh, VR streaming services, but, you know, they use their own kind of hardware setups and, you uh, their, their, their workstations are tied into their cameras and, and streaming. And, and so then you have to use their software on the uh, VR headsets, but, but that does exist. And there are some services that are out there doing it. They often partner with places like the NBA, et cetera. So technically, yeah, it's doable. Will it be as good as what likely Blackmagic and Apple are going to be delivering? Probably not. This is going to be nice. Yeah. Uh it's more of just that it'll feel like a real camera. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff that we've done so far feels all, all feels like a hack um, that we're doing. And some of them are better hacks than others. Like for instance, that Canon lens uh, that, that was shown there on a, on a Raptor, on a, 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 a red Raptor um, is actually a pretty good solution. And they worked with Meta to get, you know, better IP outputs from those cameras already. So getting 4K per eye has been something that has been doable. This is a big jump up because we're talking 90 frames a second at 8K per eye. That is a crazy number. Like that is a, it's a crazy amount of data. So all four of those 10 gig <laughs> could, could, they could be easily filled. The question is, is how much compression will they add to it? But, you know, right now, to give you a sense of it, uh, eight, I shoot 8K 120 um, on, a, uh, on the Blackmagic 12K, and that is heavily compressed. I think it's 12 to one compression to get to one gig per one gig per second. Like, so to get it down to something that I can put a hard drive and connect it to the tech cam, because the camera output is only a one gig connection. So, so to get it to that point is, is difficult. So anyway, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, 
Uh, coming up in the rest of the week, uh, Chris Galen is going to be here tomorrow. He is a audio touring engineer and former head of chief en- or head chief engineer of Chicago's Lincoln Hall. We're really excited. That's going to be a great second hour in the audio day tomorrow. Um, we video brainstorming. So if you want to think about what we're going to do uh, on Thursdays with Bill, um, come to come Thursday and we'll talk about it. We'll brainstorm on what what you would like us to to cover. So this is really a chance for you as the producers to um, put your two cents in. Um, Friday is we're going to talk about uh, repair and distribution. What are the options out there? Uh, Terry McAdams and Garrett uh, uh, Cleversley is going to are going to talk about an authorized reseller and repair. That should be really interesting. And of course, Saturday is Q and A, and Sunday is introspection. So, a lot coming up. Welcome back, and uh, we are um, 